Praise the Lord. The book of Romans, chapter number 8, verses 1 through 9. I'm going to ask you to help us pray for a ministry that we're starting. Uh, we're going to make an announcement over the weekend, but it's going to start uh, in the next week to 10 days. We're starting a program called Grief Share. Uh, it is a national program. It's been used around the country uh, to help people that are dealing with grief for loss. And um, we have we've have several needs uh, here in our area, as a matter of fact, a gentleman called just uh, just yesterday asking if we had a program. We were able to tell him that we're getting ready to start in the next 10 days. So if you'll pray for that program, there's a lot of hurting people in, uh, in our community, in our area, and in our church that we can help with that. So if you'll be in prayer for that, I appreciate it. Romans chapter number 8, verses 1 through 9. If you found it, say praise the Lord. <clears throat> there is therefore now... No condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, amen, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. But for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, and neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. Isn't that wonderful? But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. One of my favorite passages from the New Testament, Romans chapter number 8. And uh, I'm going to teach a Bible study. We've been in the book of Acts. I've, I taught 13 weeks on Acts, and then we had guest preachers and holidays and all kinds of stuff in between. Um, but several weeks ago, uh, I had a request to teach a lesson on this particular subject. So we're going to talk tonight about the Roman road, the Roman road. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your people. I thank you for what we've already heard tonight. I pray, God, that you would touch our children's classes, our juniors class, our youth classes, our grow classes, and God, our Bible study here in the sanctuary tonight. I pray, God, that you would let your anointing Move and that you would let your word find good ground, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise, and you can be seated tonight. For those of us who have been raised in the church, we have very little understanding of the perspective of people who are not Pentecostal. We use languages, a language that a lot of out, quote unquote insiders don't know what we mean by it. Um, I had a guy one time, we used to say in, in Indiana, we used to say we would march and bring our offering. And when we said march, he thought we meant literally march, like an army. Um, we have a language that people don't understand. When we say we're going to give God glory, we're talking about shouting. When we say shouting, we're not talking about yelling, we're talking about dancing. Because we have our own language that we use that people don't understand. And so, every denomination has their own language that the people on the inside know what we're talking about, but the people on the outside have no understanding of what we mean by it. And so, one of the things that we have people that ask questions occasionally uh, is a 
is a prominent Christian ideology referred to as the Roman road. How many have heard about the Roman road? There's several hands, several hands around that have gone up. And so it's a collection of verses from the book of Romans that are used to tell somebody how to be saved. These verses are misapplied, misinterpreted in a way that well-intentioned and sincere people have embraced a plan of salvation that is not a plan of salvation at all. One thing that we, that we have to understand is that sincerity is not an indication of accuracy. Sincerity is not an indication of, uh, of accuracy. Paul, when he was Saul of Tarsus, was 100% sincere in his persecution of the church. But his sincerity didn't mean he was right. He thought he was doing the work of God by persecuting Christians, putting them in jail and helping them be executed. And he never forgave himself for that. And so the Roman road is a collection of verses from the book of Romans that, uh, that are used to try to tell somebody how to be saved. And so we know... We know that the original ground zero birthday church plan of salvation is given in the book of Acts chapter number two. Amen. I had, I had somebody uh, just, just, man, just within a few minutes of church starting uh, tell me about a conversation they had with somebody that, uh, that is not Pentecostal. And, uh, and their complaint about Pentecostals was that we use the book of Acts too much. And so I'm going to say, guilty as charged. But we don't use it too much. We just use it. We know that the people on the day of Pentecost asked the most important question, what do we need to do to be saved? And they got the original answer. Then Peter said unto them, Acts 2, 38, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is the original, purest, only answer to the question, what do I need to do? So let's, let's look tonight for a few moments on the Roman road. What I'm hoping to do is be able to equip you uh, to be able to answer questions, maybe, and I, and I do want to welcome our online audience. Maybe there's people watching, and you've got questions about what we believe. Maybe you've, you haven't been raised in Pentecostalism, and you're curious about what we believe, and this would be a good start to, uh, to, to launch out into. So let's, let's look at the Roman road. There are several different versions. I, I actually have been studying the Roman road for several weeks now. Uh, as, as, I, as I have been preparing for this lesson. And what I found is there's several forms of, of this particular Bible study series, uh, Bible study idea, tract, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but they all basically come down to five basic thoughts that are, are uh, taken from verses in various parts of the book of Romans. So let's, let's look, first of all, before we get into what the Roman road actually says, let's, let's look at what the fundamental flaw of the Roman road plan of salvation is. The fundamental issue is that the book of Romans was not written to lost people. The book of Romans was not written to lost people. In the New Testament, you have four categories of the books of the New Testament, 27 books of the New Testament, four categories. You have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These, the word gospel means good news. It's the message of Jesus Christ. It talks about his birth, his life, his death and resurrection. The gospels are the story of Jesus Christ. How he came, why he came, what he did while he was here, and how he died for our sins and resurrected from the grave. It's the story of Jesus Christ. What the gospels are, are the story of how salvation came to us. How Jesus Christ took on the form of a man, died for our sins. Then you have the book of Acts, which is the history of the church. 
It's the story of how the church was born, how the church lived, and how the church spread the gospel in their world. It's what the apostles did. It's how they started the church, how they spread the gospel. Then you have the, the epistles. The epistles, the word epistle means the letters. It's the letters from the apostles to the churches. These are letters written primarily by the hands of Paul, but also by some others. They're the letters from the apostles to the churches or to leaders of churches. They're about how to stay saved, how to live a Christian life, how to operate the church, matters of church government, doctrine, church discipline, ecclesiology matters. They are letters about how the church should operate and function. And then you have the apocryphal book, which is the book of Revelation. That just simply means that it concerns the matters of the end time, the end of the world, the end of the earth of the church age. And so you have the gospels that tell you what Jesus did. You have the epistles that tell the church how to operate, the book of Revelation that tells how the world is going to end. But then you have the book of Acts, which tells us how to be saved. So of all the New Testament books, only one of them directly answers the question, what do I need to do to be saved? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The book of Acts was written as a, as a message to a man named Theophilus of all that Jesus began to do and teach and what the church did with the message of the gospel so that he could know the Gospels are how salvation was bought by the blood of Christ. The epistles are how to live in the kingdom of God. Revelation is how the world ends, and the book of Acts is how to get saved and how to save others. To settle the issue, let's look at the book of Romans. Romans was written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, it's believed to have been written either in late uh, A.D. 55 into uh, possibly as late as, as 57. Those are the most accepted dates. And so we're talking about it being written some 25 to 27 years or so after the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. So Jesus ascends, Acts chapter 1, and then about 25 years later or so, the book of Romans is written by the Apostle Paul. It is a writing that talks to the church at Rome. It's Paul's letter to the church at Rome, to the believers in the church at Rome. So the book of Acts, the book of Acts begins all the way back at the resurrection of Christ. It begins shortly after Jesus has resurrected. The book of Acts talks about what he did in the days between his resurrection and his ascension, where he ascended into heaven in the clouds, and he said that as he went, he'll come back in like manner. It talks about what he did then. So the book of Acts, the subject matter, goes basically back to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and goes forward, what did the church do from that moment? It talks about the upper room. It talks about what the apostles preached and taught, how they spread the world, how they took the gospel to different parts of the world. And that is the story of the salvation and the start of the church. The book of Romans, however, 25 to 27 years after those events. My question is that if Romans tells us how to be saved, then the book of Acts would have talked about the Roman road. Because the book of Acts answers the question, what do I need to do to be saved? But nowhere did the book of Acts say what the quote-unquote Roman road says. And so for 25 years, there, there's no record of that ever being a message of the church, okay, when, in regards to salvation. And so the book of Romans is not a plan of salvation. The book of Romans is a message to believers about a specific set of subjects that Paul was trying to cover. And so who was Roman, who was was the book of Romans written to? It was written to the church at Rome. No, lo, notice with me Romans 1, 7, and 8. Romans 1, 7, and 8. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. 
Grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the world. So who is he writing it to? He's writing it to people who are called to be saints and whose faith is spoken about throughout the whole world. These are people who have already believed the gospel. They're saved people. The book of Romans was written to saved people, not lost people. All right? And so verse 8 said their faith is spoken of throughout the whole world, people who had already been born again. So fundamentally, the Roman road plan of salvation is an out-of-context approach because that's not the purpose. That's not why Romans was written at all. It's taking a message to one group of people and applying it to an unintended audience. It's giving and giving it an unintended meaning. The Roman, the, the Roman road begins with a hermeneutical error, a misapplication of the scripture that fundamentally flaws their intended message. I know that sounds rough, but it's still true. Paul's purpose for writing the book of Romans was not to save them. It was to encourage, instruct, and correct people who were already saved. Let's look at verse 11 and 12 of Romans 1. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end that you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. He's saying, I want to come talk to you. I want to come be with you. He said, because I want to impart something spiritual to you. I want to give you a spiritual gift. I want to impart some spiritual gift so that you can be established. I'm trying to establish you. I'm trying to settle you. I'm trying to get you established in truth. And that is that we may be comforted together with you by mutual faith. He said, you already believe the same thing I do. We have mutual faith. You believe the same message I believe. You have the same doctrine I have. And so it's the mutual faith of both me and you, of you and me. And so he's not writing this to lost people. He's establishing, I'm writing it to people that believe the same thing I do, the mutual faith of both you and me. And so Paul's writing to the Roman church is a writing to people already saved about how to stay saved. Now, there's an issue in the church at Rome. There's a major issue in the church of Rome that Paul is dealing with throughout this book. Uh, if, you'll, if you take a, a macro view of the entire book of Romans, what you realize as you go into the first three chapters, Paul establishes what's going on. There's a contention in the Roman church. There's a problem in the Roman church. The problem is between Jewish converts and Gentile converts. The, the Jewish converts and the Gentile converts are having issues with one another. They come from different backgrounds. They have different customs. They have different lifestyles. They've come from different countries. They've come from different homes. They don't have the same rituals. They don't have the same background. You know, the, the Jews can go all the way back to, uh, to, to Adam and Eve, and they go all the way back to Noah and Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and they have this rich, deep heritage in faith and the Gentiles that, that have come, they come from, from idol worship and they come from all these, these various religions and they, and they bring, and so as they're trying to bring the Gentiles and the Jews together into one church, they're finding that they have issues, they have trouble. And so Paul is, is trying to deal with this, this issue in the church that the Gentiles don't like the Jews and the Jews don't like the Gentiles. And so he's dealing with this contention. The message of the book of Romans is that everyone's a sinner. We were all lost. Whether you were Jew or Greek, whether you were bond or free, we were all lost. We all needed a Savior. It doesn't matter if you come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You still needed Jesus. And it doesn't matter if they spent their whole life bowing down to, to idols of, of false gods and, and false religions. They needed Jesus just like you did. They were no more lost than you were because you needed Jesus too. Amen. 
And so that's the issue that Paul's dealing with in the book of Romans. And, and, and I, we could do, take a long time to establish that, but you're just going to have to understand as we go through that that's the footing that Paul's dealing with. So Romans is not a book about salvation. It's a, it's a book about putting us all on equal footing before Christ. And so this Roman road, the Roman road, as, as the tract has it, begins with Romans 3, 10 through 12. As it is written, there is, one, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together, become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. And then he goes to verse 23, Romans 3. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What Paul is establishing is everybody needed a Savior. Everybody needed a Savior. There's not one righteous, no, not one. You may say, well, I'm from Abraham, so I'm righteous. No, you're not righteous. There's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short. What he's doing is he's saying, hey, look, we're all in the same boat. What he's saying is everybody's a sinner that needs God. And we have no fundamental argument with that from the standpoint of the Roman road. We all, we realize that. We all need a Savior. We all need God. We all need Jesus. We all need his blood. We all need his mercy. We all need his grace. We all need Jesus. We have no fundamental argument with that point at all. Everyone is a sinner. The second plank of the Roman road is Romans 6 and 23. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. A fundamental, a fundamental principle of the entire Bible is that sin brings judgment. It's established all the way back in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve sinned, sin brings judgment. It advances to the story of Cain and Abel, the story of Noah, the story of, of the Tower of Babel, sin brings judgment. It's a fundamental principle from the, from the entire word of God. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The bottom line is everybody's a sinner and the penalty of sin is death. We have no, we don't disagree with that whatsoever. That, I mean, it's the Bible that's rightly applied. That's what it means. The third plank of, of uh of the Roman road is Romans 5 and 8. It says, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is a wonderful verse. He commended his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, when we were the enemies of God, when we didn't live right, when we didn't act right, we didn't love him, we didn't serve him, we didn't even know him. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. He paid the, cro the, the, the price at the cross while I was a sinner. He died for me when I was his enemy. When I was against him, he died for me. The old song says, I owed a debt I could not pay. And he paid a debt he did not owe. This position, we agree wholeheartedly that Jesus died for our sins. So you follow the logic. Everybody's a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But he commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Friends, that's the best news you can ever have. That's why it's called the gospel. Amen. So we have no argument with that position either. The fourth plank, Romans chapter number 10, verses 9 and 10 and verse 13. Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And verse 13 says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here is where the misapplication begins. Verse 9, we read it to you. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart 
that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The word confess, the word confess, it says confess with your mouth. So it's obviously talking about things that we speak. Confess with your mouth, words that we say. But it's, that, that word confess is more than just to say words. The definition means to agree or, or to embrace. It's not enough to simply say Jesus is Lord. But it really means to agree that Jesus is Lord. Anybody can say anything, can't they? Anybody can say anything. But he said, what you've got to confess is that Jesus is Lord. The word Lord means master, controller, authority. It, here's the definition. He to whom a person or thing belongs. If he's my Lord, I belong to him. It means the supreme controller, the supreme authority, the one who has the deciding power in my life, the one who has control of my life. If he does not have control of how I live, he is not my Lord. I can say anything I want. How many know Christians that are no Christian at all when it comes to how we live our life? Confess with your mouth means more than just to say it. It means to embrace it. The word, and then it goes on to say, and believe in thine heart. The word believe there means to commit to or to have fidelity to and trust. Believing is more than thinking it in our mind. It includes committing ourselves to it. And so he said, if you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart, Belief is in the heart, confession is in our words. We believe Christ in our heart and by our words, but when our heart truly believes, we begin to speak and confess the words. And so, then he goes on, it goes on, Paul says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here, here is where the dichotomy is. That we all know that not everyone who claims to be a Christian is actually a Christian. We know that not everyone that started has kept the faith. Paul is not giving a method of salvation. He is explaining what happens when God begins to work on somebody's heart. When God begins to work on somebody, the word begins to get in the heart. Their heart accepts him as Savior. They believe on him as the Savior. That belief causes them to confess with their mouth his lordship over their life. And then we allow him to control our life and we obey him. But this conviction of heart and mind must lead to more than mere words. It must lead to obedience in our life or he is not our Lord. Because you do not serve a Lord who you do not obey. You do not have a Lord that can't order your actions. If God can't give you things to obey, then he is not your Lord. Ken Roach, a Methodist minister and writer, he said, quote, Grace leads to faith, faith leads to obedience, and obedience leads to righteousness. Isn't that a great quote? Grace leads to faith, faith leads to obedience, and obedience to righteousness. So what does Paul expect? What does Paul expect from people who confess and believe? That's the question. What does Paul expect people who confess the Lord and believe in their heart? What does he expect them to do? Look at just, just a couple of verses later, Romans 10 and 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. They've confessed, they believed, but they have not all obeyed. For Esaias said, Lord, who hath believed our report? He said, it's not enough just to hear it, you gotta, you gotta believe. He said, but here's, what, here's how we're gonna know. He said, not everybody that says it has believed the gospel, has obeyed the gospel. The bottom line is that confession and belief must lead to obedience to the gospel. And the gospel 
as given when they ask the question, what shall we do? The answer is repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Paul said, you got to confess with your mouth, you got to believe in your heart, but you also have to obey the gospel. Finally, the Roman road finishes with its fifth plank. Romans 5 and 1, Romans 8 and 1, and Romans 8, 38 and 39. Romans 5 and 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we believe that. That once we're, once we're born again, once we're justified by faith, that we have peace with God. We're not at war with God anymore. We're not, our sins aren't a wedge between us and God anymore. Once we have been justified by faith, we're, we're not enemies of God. We're not sinners. We don't, we don't have the penalty of death on us anymore because we can't be judged for something that's been washed away. Romans 8 and 1, there's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Amen. When we are in Christ Jesus, there's no more condemnation. What is the condemnation? The condemnation is the wages of sin is death. If you have sin, then death is the penalty. That's the first where we started at. There's none righteous, no, not one. And the wages of sin is death. But Paul said, there's no more condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ, you don't have to worry about the death penalty for sin anymore. If you're in Christ, you don't have to worry about what's going to happen in eternity anymore. If you're in Christ, you don't have to worry that, man, I'm going to have to pay for what I did way back when. When you get in Christ, you don't have to worry about the condemnation of your past sin anymore. Amen. We believe that. The question then, if my condemnation, you know what a condemnation is when, when somebody's condemned to die? When somebody, Brother, Brother Tucker, he, he's, he's, he does a lot of defense attorney, and when somebody is, is, is found guilty and they are condemned, that means it's done, right? That, that's, they're, they're condemned, that means they've got to pay the price. When, a, when somebody is condemned to die, for their, for their crime, that means they're condemned. They're, that's the penalty. They're going to suffer the penalty for their action. But Paul said there's no more condemnation. You don't have to worry about the sin you've committed. You don't have to worry about what you did last year, last, last month. You don't have to worry what you did 10 years ago. You don't have to worry about how you lived all those years. If you're in Christ, there's no more condemnation for it. You might have been guilty, but the condemnation is taken away. You might have done it, but the penalty is taken away. He said there's no more condemnation. There's no more penalty to those that are in Christ Jesus. So the question is how do I get in Christ Jesus? If getting in Christ is the way my penalty is taken away, I got to figure out how to get in Christ, right? You with me? Everybody with me, all right? So the question is not, the, the question is how do I get into Christ Jesus? Galatians 3, 27, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. I don't get in Christ by confession, I don't get in Christ by believing. I get in Christ by obeying the gospel. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You cannot be baptized by confession. You cannot be baptized by believing. The only way you can be baptized is by being baptized. And it's by baptism that we become in Christ. And so the penalty is not taken away by our confession, and the penalty is not taken away by our belief. Our penalty is taken away by our obedience to the gospel. That's what Paul said. 
confessing with your mouth, believe in your heart. He said, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. At the bottom line, at the end of it, you have to obey the gospel. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And Paul wrote to the Galatians that we get in Christ by baptism. Amen. Say praise the Lord. Baptism washes away the sin. And if it's washed away, you can't be condemned by something that's not there anymore. Praise God. Amen. As many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. The Bible says that we become, that when we're baptized, we become a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. But Romans 8 and 1, we just did... The first part of it, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, comma, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. It requires a walk with God. It requires a walk with God. Not only do we get baptized into Christ, but then we have to live for him. We have to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. This mentality that says we can live however we want, do whatever we want, go wherever we want, wear whatever we want, say whatever we want, treat people however we want, drink whatever we want, put whatever we want in our body, and and just live however we want to and still call myself a Christian on Sunday morning. That is a damnable lie from hell. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The bottom line is we need to walk in the Holy Ghost if we're going to be saved. Amen. It's more than just kneeling down and repeating a sinner's prayer and getting up and going back to your old life. There is a change that happens when we get in Christ Jesus and we walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. Amen. It's, a, it's obedience to the gospel and walking in the spirit. Romans 8, 38, 39, I'm almost done. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. People often take these two verses as a validation of a doctrine called eternal security. Uh, The technical term in in five-point Calvinism is perseverance of the saints. Uh, The the street word is once saved, always saved. You've probably heard at least a couple of those, uh, at least one of them at some point. But that's not the message of these verses. The message of these two verses is that once you're saved, the devil can't take your salvation. Demons and angels and governments, principalities, powers, other people can't take your salvation. Circumstances can't take your salvation. Think of the context. It's written to Christians in Rome when being a Christian was illegal in Rome. You're hated by the Roman Empire You're not allowed to be buried in their soil. That's why they buried them in the catacombs deep underground because they they weren't allowed to bury a Christian in the the ground because they thought it defiled the soil. And so they dig these catacombs and bury them down low. They would have their church services very often in these these subterranean uh, caverns because they were in danger always. Of, of, of arrest and persecution and death and being taken to the Colosseum and, and forced to fight gladiators or lions or other, other animals for sport. And you're living in Rome. At the best, you're a slave. At the worst, you're condemned to die. But in the middle of all this persecution, in the middle of all this suffering, when it looks like that all everything is against you, Paul says, here's what I believe. Death nor life, angels or principalities, nor powers nor things. When they say principalities, principalities like like local governments. Sometimes it's talking about spiritual government. Powers is are, it refers to nations. 
He said, local governments, nations, the empire, things that are present, things going on in your life right now, things you're dealing with right now, troubles and trials and things you're going through now, and whatever comes in your future, however bad it might get, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a you can make it passage. This is a you can make it pa- Whatever you're going through, you can make it. Whatever you're fighting, you can make it. Whatever you're dealing with, you can make it. If you're dealing with physical pain, you can still be saved. If you got people persecuting you, you can be saved. If they arrest you and throw you in the Colosseum, you can still be saved. They can't take your salvation. This is a you can make it passage, not a you've already made it passage. And so on the subject of eternal security, once saved, always saved, whatever you want, perseverance of the saints, it's the, uh, the fifth point of Calvinism. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul said in verses 1 and 2, moreover, brethren. So when you see the word brethren, who's he talking to? Now, he's writing to, to the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians is the writing to the church at Corinth, saved people in Corinth. When, he's t- when he says, moreover, brethren, he's saying, he's saying he's talking to saved people, right? Brethren, church people. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Past tense, I already preached it to you. Which also you have received. You've already received it. You've already obeyed it. Wherein ye stand. He's writing to saved people, right? Born again people. Verse number two, by which also ye are saved. Saved people. What's that next little word? If. Wait a second. Why is there an if there? If you're once saved, always saved, there's no ifs. I mean, always is always, right? So, if doesn't sound like The letter's already sealed and mailed and you're good forever. He said, you are saved if you keep in memory what I've preached unto you, lest you have believed in vain. (laughs) It is 100% clear that he's writing to saved people. He literally says, you are saved. But then he says, you can't have believed in vain. We've got to be, we've got to understand. I'll be honest, I want everybody to be saved. Wherever they're from, whatever they've done, whoever they are. Every, every nation, every color, every creed, I wish everybody would be saved. Every Republican, Democrat, everyone in between, everybody everywhere. I want them to be saved. But what I want and what the Bible says are not the same thing. So the message to the book, to the, to the Romans, Romans is not a message, a book about a salvation plan. Romans is to a church trying to survive in a difficult environment and culture with issues and trials within the church that they're trying to deal with. The general message of the book of Romans is there's no difference between Jews and Gentiles. The Lord of the Jews is the Lord of the Gentiles. When you're born again, when you're, when you're converted and you're born again, we're all the same before him. The Roman road is not about eternal salvation of individuals. It's about the creation of a church community where people who used to be against each other find themselves united at the cross because they all need a Savior. He was dealing with real church issues, real church problems, and Christians that were dealing with real issues in the community. He was not giving them a salvation plan. And so what he's doing is he's bringing them together. And so, and so what we understand is that the epistle of 
of, to the church at Rome is a message to the saved people in the church. And it's every word of the book of Romans is true. It's the word of God. But it is not a salvation plan. It is a message to the church about how to live in Christ. Lord Jesus, I thank you, God, for your people. I thank you for this time we've had together for your word. God, I pray that you would open our understanding, let the word find good ground in our hearts. I pray for everyone that's here in the sanctuary tonight, everyone that's joining us online. God, there's power in the word. There's power in the truth. I pray that it finds good ground in our lives and brings forth fruit. God, I pray in the name of Jesus, help us, God, to take your word, hide it in our heart, open our understanding so we can be good witnesses and good servants for you. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. 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 Remember revival Sunday morning, Sunday night, and next Wednesday, Brother Sean Garnett. And remember the uh, Friday evening, 730, the service at Blue Mountain, the district uh, midwinter camp meeting service with Brother Maupin and the visitation for Sister Marie, uh, five to nine, Friday night, Holly Springs Funeral Home, and the funeral at the funeral home at 11 o'clock. God bless you. You are dismissed in Jesus' name.